Hello, son. We're closing in on Christmas, and I just wanted to tell you a few Christmas Park Ranger horror stories. This is a Sunday compilation of my best performing stories this week. So do enjoy, and don't forget to subscribe, son. Deep in the Ozarks, my brother Jasper and I would go visit Uncle Jack out in the deep woods. It would seem like it would take hours to get up there, but really it only took three hours. When we got there, I would go exploring back behind my Uncle Jack's house. We were told that if we went back to those woods to bring a small firearm with us, because we might see some bears out and about or a mountain lion, we would venture back there to our little fort we had made a few years back. There were still some little spots to patch up on the roof, but other than that it was still the same as we had left it. There were some old car posters and fifty dollars left in the fix. Me, Gan, we spent countless hours up there. I remember looking out the window one night and seeing these red eyes. They made me shiver. I felt as if they were looking directly into my soul, reading into my anxiety and fear. But in typical Jasper, my brother would just chalk it off as some old wolf or something. Well, it was time for some much-needed rest and relaxation, away from it all, so we're headed out into the old deep woods again. Yeah, it was sort of a journey, but it was worth it every single time. Finally, we arrived and went straight into the woods for a hike. Thankfully, unlike Jasper, I came prepared. I had some trail mix bars and gallon of water so I wouldn't be too tired during the hike. It could get pretty tricky on the hills in the area with the many switchbacks present there. We came back later that evening and had dinner with my family. My uncle would tell us one of his tall off, the wall tales. My dad would say it would always be about that half-human flying creature. He said he had saw it one time while he was back behind his property cutting some wood with his chainsaw. Uncle Jack says it cut out on him all of a sudden. He and was about to crank it back up. But something startled him. He says he saw the half-human flying creature with blood-red eyes. Uncle Jack said they locked eyes for a second, and he saw something so bad that it shook him to his very core. He couldn't even begin to describe that harrowing experience. Uncle Jack says it still gives him nightmares. Me and my brother think that he is cuckoo, you know, not right in the head. He's telling us the story again and says, fine, you kids don't believe me, just wait, and maybe you will see it this summer. We say okay, Uncle Jack, kind of, with a tremble to our voice. Later in the evening, I and my brother are playing video games. I'm getting bored, so I take a little break and doze off in the recliner chair. The next day, we go into town for a few things to fix up our little fort. All it needs is a few boards and some screws. It takes a while to get two items because Jasper is always checking out the plants or the latest gizmos and tools they have at the Bill's Home Improvement Store. I finally pull Jasper away. We get out and start walking to go get some lunch from one of our favorite places, Henry's Melting Pot Madness. Henry's has this amazing, world-famous triple cheese, bacon bit, spicy, five-alarm chili that are to die for. I'm drooling just thinking about it, but then something strange happens. Some crazy guy from the street walks up to me and whispers something in my ear and quickly hands me a small piece of paper before quickly running away. I think nothing of it at first and stick it in my pocket and keep moving. There are always a few crazies out and about town. Then we head on down to the diner to go get some lunch. I get their world-famous spicy five-alarm chili and their all-American hamburger. Jasper gets the chicken strips, and as we finish up lunch, my brother keeps going on about our waiter and how hot she was. I'm like, okay, go ask her on a date. Stop telling me about it. I guess I moved too quickly or something because the small piece of paper fell onto the ground. I looked at it, and there were some numbers written down. They didn't seem like regular numbers because they were spaced out like coordinates with dots in between. I was like they got to be some sort of location. I go ahead and punch them in my rose gold iPhone, and it's to some location that's out there in the woods. It's maybe a few hours walk. So I think to myself, oh, cool, an adventure. I tell Jasper that we should go check it out. He says, uh, I don't know, maybe. 
then we realize that we're so busy thinking about lunch that we forgot to get the beer. We go back into town for the beer, and then we run into that same crazy guy, and he whispers something else in my ear. Except this time he tells me about a creature and says it only comes out once every 200 years to feed on the town. I thought that was strange that crazy wasn't my Uncle Jack, but they both talked about a scary creature. What was going on here? Sure, it was just two people in the town talking about the creature, but it was still two people in the same town who had no relation to each other talking about a strange creature. Was it a coincidence? I had to find out. It started drizzling a little. I was wet, a little excited, and feeling anticipation of future events. Now we're heading back to Uncle Jack's house. The day is mostly over, and Uncle Jack's already nursing his sweet moonshine in his room. So we turn in for the day. I so badly want to talk to him about the strange man and the coordinates, but I know that he wants his peace and quiet for the evening. I drift off to sleep. The next day we wake up and see no sign of Uncle Jack. We make some eggs and bacon, scarf our food down, and go work on the fort. Finishing the fort takes up most of the day. It's late in the evening now. I'm a little tired, and I'm sitting down, gazing off into the distance, and I get this weird sensation. I swear I see some red eyes peering back at me. Was it really there? Was my mind playing tricks on me? I don't know what to think. Jasper already thinks that I'm off on a wild goose chase, so I can't really tell him I saw these eyes. I know he won't believe me. I glance down at my watch. It's around 8.30 p.m. It's time for us to go back to Uncle Jack's house, get some food, and we go to sleep. We're so tired. We don't even take a shower. We don't even take a shower. We just eat and go straight to sleep. The next morning, we head back to town and eat breakfast at Henry's Melting Pot Madness. Jasper and I get out of the restaurant and run into the same crazy old man. He shuffles on past us, and I yell out that I think I saw red eyes in the woods last night. The crazy old man stops, slowly turns toward us, and asks, Are you sure you saw blood red eyes, eyes like you've never seen before, or are you yanking my chain? I say yes, he steps back a little, almost fearful, and says, well, you two should consider yourself lucky that it didn't get you. I say, yeah, I guess, to the crazy old man. I told him that we were thinking about going to the coordinates that he had put on that paper and go see what's really out there. He said you must be very careful on your travels through the woods, and then he handed me some strange crystal. The crazy old man said that you may need it to open a door. I say open a door. He says yes, but it's really like a portal. The crystal has been passed down to me by my ancestors, and only closing that portal for good is the only way to get rid of the creature forever. Jasper said let's go. I can see that he's a little freaked out and interested in the adventure. Rolling my eyes, not today, I say. We gotta get ready for this thing. We still got to get some supplies. Don't think we are going empty-handed to go face-to-face -face with this otherworldly creature. Remember, we can't tell Uncle Jack about this or he'll try and stop us. Jasper thinks about it and says that I'm right. I say we will have to go out there in a few days when the moon is just right this week. That's when that supposed creature should come out of its dwelling. I think I don't know why I said that out loud. For some reason, I have this feeling that it comes out during a specific time. Jasper breaks my train of thought and says, Oh, yeah, you know what's crazy. I heard that people around town have been coming up missing. What's strange is all of these places are close to the woods. That's weird, I think, is the creature somehow making the people walk in and never come back out. Did the crazy old guy have anything to do with this? What did he know? That's why we got to go into the woods and see if we can find any of the missing townspeople. We still have a few days till the moon is blood red. That's when the creature should really start attacking the townspeople, says the crazy old town guy. We went to my Uncle Jack's house and were aghast. All the stuff had been thrown around like a tornado had gone throughout the house. Jasper and I found a piece of paper. My uncle had written something down, and it was different coordinates than what the crazy old guy in town had given to me. So I go plug it into the GPS, and it's three hours south. This is going to be a long journey. We pack, go to sleep, and head out in the morning. 
As we are walking through the forest, we begin to hear some strange buzzing noises. Jasper and I are a little drained from the sun beating down on us. We stop and take a break. Jasper leans back and falls down a seven f hole. I cry out, Jasper, are you hurt? I hear nothing, it seems like forever, but then I hear him respond, Jessica, help. Well, yeah, I want to get out of here. Pull me out. I tell him, don't pass out. I'm getting something to pull you out with. I race around, find a long, sturdy branch, and I pull him out. He only has some scrapes. I think he was just being melodramatic. I pull out my first aid kit and bandage him up. We set back our way. It starts to get late, and we set up camp for the night. Jasper and I go ahead and take shifts to stay up just in case we might see the creature. He takes the first shift. I drift off for a little while. Suddenly I start to hear the buzzing noise again. As if under a trance, I slowly start walking that way and there before my eyes was a portal. I was shocked at first, but then I saw my uncle come out of the portal. It was my uncle, but then it was not. He had some different hair color like maybe someone had made a copy of him or something. I had broken a branch. It made a loud noise, and that thing that looked like my uncle looked over and started running to the campsite. I start running, too. I come back all drenched in sweat, and Jasper looks at me and asks, Where the hell have you been? Well, there was this buzzing noise, so I went checked it out. And, uh, I saw Uncle Jack, but it wasn't him. Jasper tells me, okay, Jessica, I believe you. Now try and go back to sleep. I tell him, are you serious? I can't go back to sleep after all of that. He says, okay, fine then. Just stay here and don't wander off now, okay? Then he goes back into his tent. I glance down at my tactical romp, 5,000 watts. It's still 2 a.m., still a lot of time to maybe see the creature I think to myself. Yet once again I start hearing that buzzing noise. I do my best to ignore it, but yet don't know how Jasper is still asleep. He can sleep through a tornado, I think. Suddenly a swarm of giant bees starts attacking us. Jasper's fully awake now. We do the only thing we can and go get in the river real fast to get the bees to stop chasing us. We get back to camp, dry our clothes out by the fire get back in our tents and fall asleep from exhaustion. The next morning we set on the directions to our uncle's coordinates. As we're walking, Jasper tells us that he saw the red eyes last night, but he did not want to worry me. I was like, come on, Jasper. You can't just keep that stuff to yourself, and you know we are hunting that thing, so please, when you see something, say something, say something. Okay, Jasper, you know we are not that far from uncle's coordinates. Jasper says, I know, but you know it would be better if we just went ahead and crossed the river. Jessica says it would save us more time, okay, but where are we going to get a raft at? Well, we got to make one. Okay, start looking for some wood and stuff. We make the raft with some branches and some twine from our supplies. Getting across the river was a task in itself, but we cross over. Now we've got to get thought the thick forest. We still haven't seen much of the creature, but let's maybe keep it that way. Just as I say that, a creature grabs what seems like my uncle from a great distance and flies away, and Jasper falls off the raft. As I try and chase after him, yelling his name, Jasper, Jasper. Well, now we know that the creature might be going to his cave. But where's Jasper? I can't stick around for too long. The river gets cantankerous at this time. I start to head off, but the uh, mosquitoes are pretty bad, so I go ahead and spray his buzz off and hope that keeps the bugs at bay. I go and check the map, and I'm 30 clicks away from the coordinates. Er, I have to climb a hill to get there. Now I am at a cave and see some dead bodies laying there. I almost pass out from the rancid smell. I think that they might be some of the missing townspeople that Rose the barkeep told us about the other day. I check their wallets and confirm that it is. There's one problem. I don't have the right supplies for this cave. As I think that, I see what looks like Jasper coming out of the woods nearby. I don't know if he sees me. He lies against an oak tree and falls asleep. I realize I need to rest too, but I can't stop thinking about my conversation with Rose the barkeep from a few days ago. 
She told me to come with her downstairs, and she shows me another piece of crystal. I say, hey, it's like the one I got already. Yes, Rose says, but it does something whenever you put them together. Just then, a strange noise emits from the other side of the cave. I focus on it for a little bit, but then I black out. I wake up a few hours later and see that it's Jasper, looking scared and startled. I ask him what happened, and he tells me he doesn't know if he believes it himself, but says I think I saw a portal. I saw Uncle Jack run out of it. I tried to get his attention, but he couldn't hear me. I ask him, are you sure? You're not yanking my chain, are you? He says, no, I'm dead serious, and then glances over and asks where I got my other piece of crystal from. I tell him, remember when we went into town the other day? I talked to Rose, the barkeep, and she gave me this. I say as I show him the unique glowing piece of crystal. Rose told me about some ancient monster that her family has been protecting themselves against for generations going all the way back to the 1600s. She told me the creature had long, thin arms, razor-sharp fingernails, and bony skeleton face with blood-red eyes. Rose thinks the creature is what is causing the disappearances and wants it go back to where it came from once and for all. For some reason, she feels as if we are two special souls that share a similar resemblance to people within their family stories. She's saying that the events taking place are very similar to the stories that were passed down for generations in her family. I wonder why us? What's so special about us? Jasper shrugs. But the truth is that we don't have time to wait and philosophize. We're running against nature here as we only have two days to find the creature. Jasper and I start to move to the entrance of the cave. Jasper and I start to move to the entrance of the cave ties some rope to a boulder and places his hard hat with a light on it, and he descends 150 fifth down and hits the bottom of the cave. Then I drop the supplies down and enters the cave right behind him. I glance down at my crystals and I notice that they have a faint glow to them. I think it might be close by, I say. We walk for a few hours as we feel the wind somehow coming up and passing us. We get to a spot where we have to dive underwater to get past the next section of the cave. I say I will go first. But there's a current that's pulling us forward. First I put the supplies under. Then there Then Jasper says, are you crazy putting the supplies first? I say, trust me, they will be fine. We tied them all to the rope, so all we have to do is just pull them behind us when we go under. Okay, says Jasper. I won't take it all, but I will take half of the supplies, and you will take the other half. Jessica goes first, and all is well, and then Jasper goes, and then his belt gets caught. He has to cut it off, and he still manages to bring the supplies with him, all intact. I say I was beginning to worry you were not going to make it. I was about to go in after you. Then you popped up. Jasper says now your crystal necklace is really glowing now. We waste no time and start to make a small fire as we are laying by the fire and eating some food, I tell Jasper. Hey, be quiet. Did you hear that, Jasper? Jasper says, what's that loud rumbling noise? Let's go and check it out. As we go down some of the narrow passages, Jasper says, look at those stalagmites. Those things are huge, 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 huge. It echoes off the cave walls. I say you hear that squeak, squeak, squeak. Look out! A giant swarm of bats come rushing out of the tunnels, going up toward the surface. I yell out rabies, echoes, rabies, rabies, as we duck and cover their faces. They look down the hole and see red eyes down the dark tunnel. We see them coming closer, so we quickly choose the cave to the left. We are going down the cave and keep hearing this strange noise. We look up to find a portal open. We look around and find that other small door that the crazy guy was talking about back in town. I run over to the small door and start putting in the first crystal. Then the monster runs over and grabs me, but then the necklace falls to the ground. Jasper starts yelling at the creature, but he just keeps walking away with me. I struggle, but I can't escape the monster. Jasper starts running toward us, and then our uncle comes out of nowhere and starts assaulting Jasper with his fists. Jasper is startled, but starts defending himself. Jasper was able to get a good hit on the side of Uncle Jack's head. 
Uncle Jack changes his stance. He's not fighting anymore and looks bewildered. Where the heck am I? Uncle Jack asks. Jasper tells him no time to explain. Just follow me. Uncle Jack sees the necklace laying on the ground and picks it up. Jasper says the door to close all of this mayhem is not too far. And he sees that Jessica is knocked out. The monster tries to reopen the portal so he can take Jessica with him. But he has to have other crystal to fully go back to his planet. Uncle Jack and Jasper tries to run after her because she's the only one who knows the secret to really close it. They're walking down the dark tunnel with their headlamps on when Jasper looks down and finds another crystal, just like the one that Jessica had. He grabs it, and it burns his hand. What the heck, Jasper says, and quickly bandages up his hand while grabbing it with a cloth. See, it does not burn you now, does it? He says to himself. No, I guess not, but it's still hot, says Jasper. Uncle Jack says, hopefully, then soon before the blood moon, Jasper says... You mean we got to track back up to the surface? Yep, son of a bitch, Jasper says. Yeah, I know, kiddo, says Uncle Jack. As they are on, they're on their ascent back to the surface. They start to see some large cracks in the walls that were not before. Then all of a sudden, stuff starts falling off the top of the walls. Uncle says we had better start really running faster and faster. They're almost to the surface when all they have to do is just climb the rope back up. Jasper gets a hold of the rope back up. Jasper gets a hold of the rope and starts heading up. When the floor starts falling all around him, Uncle, he says, hurry up. Jasper starts going faster. He's about halfway when his uncle says that he does not think that he's going to make it seeing how the floor is falling all around him. He yells to Jasper, here, take my keys to the cabin and cars. Jasper says okay with tears falling down. His uncle gives one big throw and Jasper reaches out and grabs him and then starts climbing back to the surface as he gets there. He looks down one more time and sees the creature grab him and pull him back into the darkness. Jasper yells, you bastard, and starts heading to the graveyard. But before that, he goes over to the bar and looks for the barkeep. Someone says she's down in the cellar and Jasper heads down that way as she's putting some wine away, as she's putting some wine away on the racks. She says, Jasper, what are you doing here? Where is your sister? Jasper, trembling with tears in his eyes, said that the creature has Jessica. I need your help, please. I don't know who else to turn to right now. Everyone else will think that I'm crazy. Rose the barkeep says, okay, I'll help, but first you've got to calm down and take this shot with me. She pulls some cobweb bottle from out of this old wooden box and pulls out this dark red-looking liquid. Jasper asks, her what is that? Rose says, don't worry about it. Just drink with me. Jasper says, okay, and takes this out, starts feeling funny, and then passes out. He wakes up a few hours later and finds himself at the cemetery. Rose is standing there, too. She sees that Jasper's awake and tells him to stay quiet. It's almost midnight. Look up at the sky. The moon is almost fully blood red. Out of nowhere, the creature appears. It has Jasper's sister, and wait, who is that? That's Uncle Jack. That's Uncle Jack. To Jasper's surprise, his uncle is still alive. Jasper's taken aback. There by this strange-looking tombstone. Rose the barkeep takes quick action and says we've got to try and get over there and put our two remaining crystals over there into the tombstone. As we're shuffling down the rows of tombstones, Rose tells Jasper to run over with the two crystals and place them into the tombstone. He is the only one who can. He runs over and places crystals into the tombstone and a big surge of energy comes out of nowhere and a portal appears. The strange creature is about to go through the portal and Jessica starts to shuffle away. But for some reason, Uncle Jack grabs her and jumps into the portal. Jasper tries to reach for her arm, but it's too late. He asks the barkeep what he should do now. How can he get her back? Rose says that once the portal closes and the crystals unite, that's the end of, of the energy source. Jasper's unite, that's the end of, of the energy source. Jessica and the uncle are gone for good. Seems... This story that I'm about to share with you occurred all the way back in 2007, 
when I was visiting Yellowstone, along with some of my friends who were also interning there at the time, hence why I came to visit. A few of them got to go on to do search and rescue, while others whom I believe just helped maintain peace and integrity in the park. And during my visit, my friends, whom I'll keep their names anonymous, were just beginning their internship. During the time I really knew nothing about park rangers, other than them sitting in a tower or an office all day, or boringly patrolling around the entire park, looking for mischief, or maybe teenagers who weren't doing what they were supposed to do, but little did I know that it would have everything and anything to deal with things that go bump in the night, or things of a more supernatural nature. I wasn't exactly camping with my friends who were interning. Even though they were there with me, they had job stuff to do. So much of it involved me actually just kind of camping out by myself while getting to hang out with them during the daytime, which was fine by me. I still had a lot of fun, but at nighttime, and keep in mind this wasn't my first camping experience, not only have I gone camping out in the woods by myself, but also in campgrounds with friends, family, and solo adventures. I've never experienced anything weird or out of the ordinary, so this whole thing was a first for me. On the very first night, I awoke to a strange light outside my tent. It was actually roughly 10 to 20 feet up in the air, right above my tent. I woke up and was very startled, thinking somebody was hanging a lantern or something. But after unzipping my tent and looking up, it appeared to be this bright orb, or what I can only describe roughly the size of a tennis ball, just emanating a very soft, pale blue light. And just as soon as it appeared, it vanished, like somebody flicking the lights out. That definitely freaked me out. I ran back inside my tent and hid there as best I could from anything. And really didn't get that great of sleep that night, but can you blame me? So the following day, I told my friends about it, the ones who had just started interning. And they both were quiet. They didn't say much about it. These were the same kind of guys who would mock me and make fun of me had I ever brought up aliens or UFOs or anything ghost-related. To have them be this quiet was very strange. But the day and the time did go on. So as it did, the second night came. And this time I was hoping I wouldn't see any strange balls of light. Now at this time I did not believe in UFOs, ghosts, or anything of that nature at all, actually. I don't know if I would have considered myself an atheist, probably more agnostic than anything, but the idea of aliens or UFOs just seemed so far fetched, even though I couldn't exactly explain a tennis ball-sized orb of light directly above my tent the night before. I still wasn't about to admit to alien life, and although I told my friends they offered no input, other than uncomfortable glances staring down at the ground, trying to avoid any sort of reply they could. This just weirded me out, more than it made me feel uncomfortable. So as I was saying, the second night came, and instead of any orbs of light, I was greeted with very strange sounds far off in the distance. It sounded like King Kong, or some sort of crazy primate, except the sounds were much, much deeper. Now I know in Yellowstone there are all sorts of wildlife throughout. I mean, this entire state is very popular for that, but this just sounded like nothing from what I could ever imagine hearing. There's nothing in the United States wilderness to me that resembles the sound of a gorilla or any sort of primate whatsoever, especially ones with lungs that large and a voice that deep. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but it only appeared here and there, not all throughout the night, but parts. Very minimal, and only when I was awake. So nothing happened and startled me awake, thank goodness. The following day came and went, and I never discussed in any detail whatsoever about the previous night that occurred with my friends. These sounds that I heard, although strange and were a little alarming, wasn't a deal-breaker for me to leave. I tried to suppress any feelings I had about these weird things I had about these weird things happening. Considering, well, you know, they're not exactly normal. The third night. I had a pretty good night of sleep. Actually, I slept better than I have in months, it felt like. I slept like a rock. 
I slept like a rock, probably for around 12 hours, to be exact. The following day, same thing. Friends hung out, we did stuff, just like every other day. And on the fourth night, I slept again great. Now, it was the fifth and final day and night is when stuff got a little out of hand. See, right before I turned in for the evening, a gentleman from a few campsites overcame to me and said, Hey, I don't mean to be alarming, but a little earlier, I saw a large bear, or what I thought to be a bear, walking upright, heading in your campsite's direction. I told him thank you, and I would closely be on the lookout. He walked away, and right then I wasn't exactly sure if the Yellowstone even had grizzly bears in the area, but that he obviously had some sort of bear sighting, and I should keep my eyes peeled. Well, I never saw anything until it was time for bed. I feel it's also important, too, to make note that in Yellowstone I was in the Madison campground, which I think is the most northern part of the campground site, and there was actually very few people in it during this week. Probably because this was through a Monday and Friday, at least I can assume, there was a decent amount of people, but it was nowhere near full. In fact, I only had a few other people near my site, and by near I mean several spots over. So I definitely had privacy, and at times during the night this occurred to me every night I would have to pee really bad. So I'd get up out of my tent, and instead of going to the bathrooms, I would run into the woods, which were close by, into my business. At two o'clock in the morning, with nothing but a headlamp, it managed to work pretty good. Because, well, you're surrounded in darkness, and nobody else around is looking for you. So it's nice, and that's exactly the perfect seg to take you into exactly what happened. I get up on the very fifth night probably one in the morning, and head over to the same trees that I've been going to every other night. But this time, as I'm approaching it, something fell off, and in my sleep stupor, I never once thought about the orb of light or the weird gorilla noises I was hearing, or just how I managed to get the best night of sleep in my life the other few nights, the other few nights, and instead I felt a very familiar feeling, like I was being watched from the woods. Like the direction I was going to was dangerous. The bathrooms were easily doubled, the distance in the opposite direction, which is why I went for the woods anyway, but I just said screw it and kept going into the woods. I only went maybe ten feet in, and at that point I invent myself being very alert to the sounds and things around me. And even though I was still feeling watched, I couldn't exactly see a source of who was watching me, I did have my headlamp on, a one that just drops around your head. I'm not talking about a full helmet headlamp, so I was looking around and couldn't see anything, until I turned just enough to my right, and that was met with a reflection of eyes on a very large dark shape. It almost appeared to be gorilla, like but not quite. It was man, like as well. It's really hard to tell when you're in the forest because there's brush and trees in the way. But all I saw was the eye reflection attached to a large black silhouette, the shape of a gorilla or a man. But much, much bigger. I screamed, quickly zipped up midstream, and ran back to my tent as fast as I could, unsure of what to do. Should I tell somebody? Should I try and protect myself? I wasn't sure, so I hid in my tent the rest of the night, again just like the first night with the orb, except this time way more terrified. Had I just seen a Bigfoot? I wasn't sure, but I'd seen something. I didn't sleep at all that night either, and the morning came. I felt my adrenaline was really wearing low, and I felt exhausted. I feel like I had to call my trip quits since this was the day I was planning on leaving anyway. I met up with my buddies, hopped up on at least three cups of coffee just to try and endure my lack of sleep. I came clean and told them what I saw last night. And just like after the first night, they both went quiet and then asked me if I could keep something on the down low. I agreed. They both pulled me aside and they both told me that on their first couple days they saw really weird things in the sky. Orbs, triangles, strange shapes they can't identify. Black dark, huge humanoid silhouettes running through the woods. Yellow glowing eyes chasing them, running parallel.
All sorts of super freaky fictionist stuff. Except in their case, they were terrified when retelling it. And these dudes are duds I went to high school with. Dudes who are super serious. Science diehards, the kind of guys who, as I told you earlier, would make fun of you if you ever said you knew or saw a ghost. These guys were absolutely scared, and I've never seen them so scared of my life. But I asked them, is the job worth it? They said yes, because it only happened a few times. But obviously me bringing it up made them very uncomfortable, and almost served as a reminder to them that it's a very real part of their job. Now if we fast forward now to 2020, both of them, to my knowledge, are still working as full-time park rangers. Although with COVID, I'm not exactly sure how that's worked out for much of the environmental field of work. Maybe they're not working there anymore. I think the one stayed with Yellowstone up until at least 2020. Again, I'm assuming COVID has put a dent in things. The other one, I think, eventually transferred or moved states. I'm not sure, maybe to Pennsylvania or New York possibly Virginia. I lost contact with him, but as far as I know, he still works as a ranger, because they both just enjoy the work, I guess. And even though there is weird things to the job, they love the sights, they love the sounds, and ultimately they loved being immersed in nature. 24-7 is a part of their occupation, even though sometimes that occupation has some very strange payoffs that you have to do. I guess the question here is, did they see the same thing I did? Because when they told me about their experiences, I didn't have much to say. I mean, conversation kind of just passed and changed subjects. But I think about it from time to time, and listening to your Bigfoot encounters and your park ranger stories always brings me back to that week. I wonder if I too saw a Sasquatch out there. I know nothing of the Bigfoot population in Yellowstone, or if that even is such a thing. And I also wonder, did my two friends see Bigfoots? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, for all I know, there could be a clan of them living out here. And maybe, just maybe, one was curious enough to sneak up on me that night to see what I was doing. When I said I was feeling watched, there wasn't a feeling of danger like hostile behavior. Or that I was going to die, maybe assuming how Bigfoots are, I was just being observed. When I showed my headlamp that night and saw the silhouette, it was probably somewhere 30 to 50 feet away, behind some trees and brush. This was June, after all, which is yet another reason I was so surprised that even though during the week it was so empty compared to normal, even my friends made that comment, that they figured there'd be a lot more people which again would also make sense that there wouldn't be as much activity or sightings. More people, less Bigfoot around, assuming that's what I saw. Anyway, I don't want to try and jumble on my words here. Please don't hesitate if you have any questions. I would love to get you answers as soon as I can. Back in 1999, I used to work as a park ranger over at Yosemite National Park. It wasn't a job I ever really saw myself doing. The fact was that until I busted my knees and had to stop playing football, the NFL was all I ever dreamed of. I was obsessed. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon. And at night I used to dream of football. But like many young men's dreams, they turned out to be nothing but the stuff of pipes. I needed a job, I needed money, and I needed it fast. So when an uncle told me of an opening up at Yosemite for a park ranger, I jumped at the chance. He told me it was relatively easy work, mostly outdoors, and I could rely on it. As long as there was state funding, as long as there were still trees sprouting out of the ground, I'd always have work. So there I was, 23 years old, decked out in my park ranger's uniform, hiking through valleys and over hills, popping ibuprofen whenever my knees started to play up. I'd done the job for about two years in March of 99, and honestly, I'd grown to love it. Being out there meant being surrounded by nature on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see things weekly that wildlife photographers would give their left nuts to document. But I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd encounter the kind of thing I did on March 18, 1999. 
It's something that I've thought about almost every single day since something I can't ever get out of my mind and something I don't think I ever will. And it started off a chain of events that I gradually became obsessed with and that have changed my life forever. It started with a call about a potential forest fire up. My boss called and told me a hiker had seen some smoke rising up through the trees up near a place called Long Cabin in Sonora County. I probably don't need to tell you that forest fires can be absolutely devastating to an area like Yosemite and are taken very, very seriously by us park rangers. Now y'all should know that Long Cabin isn't technically in our jurisdiction. It's actually closer to Stanislaus National Forest. But since there was no one up in that area to go check it out, my boss asked me to go check it out. My boss asked me to go check it out and call in the fire department if it was a serious threat. We get a good number of calls like this, and more often than not, it's just a family whose barbeque has gotten out of hand, or kids whose campfire is a little too big. So I agreed to drive up there to check it out, as it was only a couple of hours drive there and back. So after about an hour's drive, I arrive up at Long Barn, and I can see some black smoke rising up through the trees in the distance. This is unusual, as black smoke means it's not just wood burning, more like plastic or artificial fabrics, so it definitely wasn't wood burning. This is kind of a relief at first. It meant it wasn't an outright forest fire, but it did mean someone was burning something that was definitely not good for the environment. I park up as close as I can to the source of the smoke, then hike off through the trees, basically just following my nose as the smell of the burning plastics got stronger and stronger. Then I see it, a burned-out car abandoned among the trees, still kind of smoldering, but I guess the fire had been set at night and had mostly burned through before I got the call about it. My first thought was joy riders. Something as simple as car thieves that had bust into someone's vehicle, tore it up and down the quiet country roads up here, then just abandoned it and set it alight to cover up any evidence. Again, this is a pretty unusual crime out here in the sticks, and you can forgive me for associating that sort of wanton mischief with more urban areas. But then I started to smell something else among the smoke, something more like burning meat. I'm a huge barbique guy myself, and I know what it smells like when you leave something on the grill for too long, like that acrid, charred stench that I know is going to lead to disappointment because I've messed up on some expensive tea, one, or whatever. Only, you're definitely not supposed to smell that coming off of a burning car, are you? And as you can imagine, I started to feel very, very uneasy about the whole thing. I circled the burned our vehicle, looking for signs of animal carcasses or, God forbid, human bodies that were in or around the vehicle, but saw nothing. I even checked under the car, but again, didn't see a thing. I pulled out my phone to get in touch with the Sonora County Sheriff, who said he'd send over a couple of guys to check the scene out within the next hour or so, but who also asked me to stick around so I could guide them in and show them exactly where the vehicle was. So, given the fact I had an hour or two to kill waiting for them, I went into the trunk of my truck, pulled out the little fire extinguisher stored back there, and proceeded to put out the few small fires still burning in and around the vehicle. I do so pretty effectively, but when I'm done and I notice there's still something smoldering in the trunk, smoke keeps seeping out of the cracks, and the more it does, the more I can smell that burning meat smell. That's when it really hit me. Something, or someone, was in that trunk. That's where the smell of was coming from. Waiting for those sheriff's deputies seemed like it took an eternity. Mainly because when they got there, I knew they'd be able to open that trunk, and I really didn't want to see what was inside. So they get there, I tell them what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect has happened, and what I suspect is in that trunk. One of the guys uses a crowbar to wrench the trunk open which was pretty easy considering the fire had warped the metal locks keeping it closed. But what we saw inside is something I saw over and over again in my nightmares for many nights to come. It was a mess of blackened, burned flesh and contorted limbs. 
The sight of it alone caused me to gag and retch, puking up my breakfast onto the forest floor. Even those deputies, hardened by years of witnessing violence and cruelty on a daily basis, had a hard time dealing with what they were seeing. One just leaned against a tree, mouth covered with a cloth rag he kept on him, probably for this exact reason, while the other called in the coroner to deal with the bodies. They told me I could make a move back to Yosemite whenever I was ready, and boy was I ready. I got the hell out of there as soon as I was able to. From what I understand, the sheriff's deputies soon discovered that the two scorched bodies in the trunk of that burned-out vehicle were those of Carola's son and Silvina Palasso. The two women, along with Carolee's son's young daughter, Julie, had been missing since the previous February, when they were last sighted alive and well at the Cedar Lodge near Yosemite National Park. It was actually one of my colleagues over at the park that had been the last person to see them alive, and the whole thing had drawn national attention, landing them on the cover of People magazine when some journalist took an interest in the story. And I mean, it was a really interesting story, albeit a very morbid one. Curly Sun's wallet had been found on a street in downtown Modesto, California three days after they had disappeared, and Julie Sun's body was found dumped in heavy underbrush by an overlook at the Don Pedro Reservoir, several miles from the logging trail where the car had been found. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear. Local sheriffs and the FBI initially focused their investigation on a group of meth heads up in Northern California who had previous convictions for stalking and assaulting lone groups of women. But all those leads were abandoned when a break in the case cast light on another suspect. Because the story doesn't end here. In fact, it got even worse for all of us that worked up in Yosemite. One of the staff members at the Yosemite Institute was a young woman named Joey Ruth Armstrong. Joey was friendly, bubbly, and generally just a joy to be around. I'd only ever met her once or twice in my time as a park ranger but I could see why she was a popular member of the team. She loved nature, and she loved nature, and she loved her job, even more passionately than most others on our staff. But in July of that same year, 1999, Joey had made plans to spend a weekend visiting friends down in Sausalito. Team members who lived in the log cabin she shared with them in Yosemite Village said their goodbyes wished her safe travels, and watched as she wandered off among the trees to catch a ride down to Sausalito. But a few days later, when she was due to return to the village, she didn't show up. She'd actually left some contact details with the team, just in case they needed to talk to her, but when they followed up with a call to check up on her, her friends told them she hadn't actually arrived to spend the weekend with them, and that they were starting to get worried. A group of rangers went over to the cabin she stayed at, only to find her white pickup truck was still parked in the driveway, packed with luggage for her trip. Having decided to begin their search in the immediate area, the rangers split up into smaller groups. They trudged through dense brush, watching for rattlesnakes and looking for signs of their missing co-worker. Then, after only a short while of searching, they apparently spotted footprints, broken saplings, trampled ferns and grass. All signs that someone had recently ran, or perhaps even been chases. That's when one of the rangers noticed something metallic glinting in the sunlight just a few feet away. It was a key ring lying in a shallow ditch. It was the sighting of this key ring that led them to spot something else. It was a dead body. It had on the white t-shirt and blue jeans that Joy had been wearing the day she left for Sausalite. Except now they were filthy, dirty, and crusted and blood-stained. But despite bearing such similarities to our missing co-workers, it was impossible to immediately identify the body. That was because whoever had killed this person had also taken the time to cut off the head, decapitating it completely. For those of us that worked in and around Yosemite, Joey's murder meant that the nightmare of the those burned bodies the nightmare we'd all tried to forget about, had come back with a vengeance. The killings were made even more disturbing to us by just how rare it was for anything like that to happen in this area of California. 
According to one of the older rangers, the last known murder to cure inside Yosemite's boundaries happened 12 years earlier. In 1987, when a guy pushed his wife off a cliff in order to collect on a life insurance policy. As you can tell, I've thought about this whole thing and researched the various murders a whole lot. And I've discovered that the chances of being murdered in one of our nation's national parks is about one in 20 million. Basically, you have more chance of drowning in your own bathtub, so please don't think this is an actual thing. People don't just hang around in the woods waiting to ambush unwary hikers. In the months that had followed the discovery of those burned bodies in the trunk of the car, the cops had almost no luck in finding a suspect. And honestly, we didn't expect Joey's murder to be any different. But unbelievably, in the immediate aftermath of her killing, local authorities got lucky thanks to a witness statement given by one of our co-workers. They had noticed a blue and white 1979 International Scout parked near Joey's cabin on the night of her death, and the cops put out an ab on it right away. Then a few days later on, two park rangers spotted a vehicle that looked remarkably similar parked on the shoulder of a highway not too far away. What happened next was truly bizarre. I spoke to the guys who found the truck, who said they searched around it for a while until they came across a guy sunbathing, completely naked, at a nearby river bank. They asked who he was, and he told them he was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge, some vacation homes built close by, and that his name was Kerry Stainer. The guy seemed kind of embarrassed that he'd been caught in the nude like that and quickly left the area. But my co-workers immediately called the encounter into local cops, who showed up and compared the tire tacks left by the truck to those left at the scene of Joey's murder. They came back as exactly identical. A few days later, the same weird guy was taken into custody while he was visiting some nudist resort over near Sacramento. When they took him into custody and interviewed him regarding Joey's murder, he confessed. Just straight up confessed then also confessed to the fact that he'd murdered Carollo's son, Silvina Palazzo, as well as Caroli's daughter, Julie. The FBI were called in for additional questioning, and it was then that Carrie Stainer told them all about how he had fantasized about hurting women ever since he was a child and how he had been completely unable to silence the voices in his head that told him to kill them. For five whole months, this absolute psychopath had been living right under our goddamn noses, hiding in plain sight. He'd been chilling up at Cedar Lodge, doing his job, and eyeing up potential victims under the pretense of being a friendly, albeit a little cookie, local handyman. From what I can gather, no one had suspected him of having anything to do with the disappearances of Sander Palazzo, because he just seemed way too nice. Too much of a regular dude, that in the Steiner family name had been in the news before, for a reason that led investigators to believe that there was no way that Carrie had it in him to do something so terrible. You see, many years before, when Carrie was just 11 years old, his younger brother, seven-year-old Stephen, disappeared without a trace one afternoon while walking home from school on his own. This devastated the family, causing a huge rift between Carrie and his dad. Eventually, Stephen escaped captivity after seven long years as the sex slave of Kenneth Parnell, a convicted pedophile and former employee of the Yosemite Lodge inside the National Park. He became a celebrity of sorts. There was national newspaper and television coverage, as well as a book and a TV miniseries chronicling his years of abuse. Whether or not that whole thing shaped Carrie into the violent psychopath he eventually became is something I don't think anyone will be able to properly determine. But shortly after, Carrie began to claim he'd seen Bigfoot. Yes, the ape, man-thing that said to inhabit the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was well on his way to be being completely detached from reality. At his trial in 2002, Carrie Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, his lawyers asserted that the entire Stainer family had a history of sexual abuse and mental illness, manifesting itself not only in the murders, but also his obsessive compulsive disorder, his obsession with cryptids, specifically Bigfoot 
in his request to be provided with obscene images in return for his eventual confession. He was nevertheless found sane and convicted of four counts of first-degree murder by a jury on August 27, 2002. The court then had to decide if he would be executed for his crimes, which it unanimously decided that he should, and rightly so. Stainer remains on death row as of September 2019, but problems with California death penalty laws are frustrating the process, and it's becoming increasingly unlikely that Kerry will suffer the same fate as his many victims. I know this was an overly long post, but as I'm sure you can all understand, this is something I've been quite frankly obsessed about since the discovery of those burned bodies affected me to personally. I'm actually considering writing a book about the whole thing, and my experiences living and working in the places that most of these crimes occurred. If I can't ever get these things out of my head, why not try and turn the whole thing into a kind of therapy? Turn it into something that others can enjoy, and maybe something I can make a few bucks out of. Even if that does make me feel like a goddamn vampire, profiting off of other people. Misery. Maybe let me know in the comments section, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed reading this, and maybe, just maybe, it'll help you stay safe in a world where people are out there with the word compulsions imaginable driving them to kill. It was an amazing day. Hell, it had been an amazing week. I was finally off from work in my little mini. Vacation was starting. I had been keeping track of the weather and made sure that the days I wanted to go on vacation would be great for some hiking and camping. I live in Altoona, Pa, in the middle of the state. My role in life is to explore every state park in Pennsylvania. I decided that when I was a youngin, I would make it my life's goal to visit and write about every park I could travel to. I'm a young man, and as long as I stayed healthy and strong, I should be able to do it. There are 111 state parks in Pennsylvania, 20 state forests, one national forest, one national forest, one national memorial, two national historic sites, and three national historic parks. I've been to half of the state forests and 30 of the state parks. I usually start at the parks on the outside of the state and work clockwise from Altoona as the six o'clock position, but I have a friend who loves Black Machannon State Park and she's always talking about how good the fishing is on the lake. She raves about the hiking and the trails and even though it's close to a highway, it's secluded enough to feel like you're in a world of your own, which is what I needed. I work at a Wawa and I kinda hit the lottery for a decent amount of money. Not enough to retire, but enough to retire, but enough to afford my condo, keep up the hole, and go on vacation when I wanted to. Which is what I'm doing now. So here we are. I'm gonna head up to Moshannon and see what the fuss is all about. I woke up about 5.30 and finished loading up the car. I got some breakfast from the job and headed up Highway 99, then cut over to Alternate 220, then on to Beaver Road, as that would take me right into the middle of Black Moshannon, past the lake and to the camping grounds. Since the deer season was ending, the park's traffic would primarily be locals and the rare tourists. I got there by quarter to ten. The sun was high and the air was cooler than average for August. It felt great, good enough for a hike. After setting up camp and securing the site with a few locks, I put on my hiking gear and decided to take a few of the off, ran trails heading north. I passed the bog near Route 504. The panorama was amazing as the sun glistened off the waters by the banks, which were covered in oak, cherry, and pine trees, trees that rose up the gentle slope of hills. I took in the fresh scent and decided after the hike, I'd do lunch then get in some fishing. I hadn't seen a soul up here yet outside of some cars on the road coming in and the park ranger who guided me to my camping lot. It was about 40 minutes into my hike when I had come across anything odd. I had taken pictures of some of the birds I saw and decided to make a mental note of the varieties I had seen. There were warblers, teals, black ducks, Canadian geese, and other avian critters. 
As I crossed over smaller bog path, I noticed a group of woodpeckers chasing a flying squirrel. Poor little critter, I said aloud to no one as I watched the aerial spat. Then a plane flew overhead, reminding me that no matter how far I go, civilization was. Um, what's that? I noted as I heard some crunching in the grass. I noticed the chittering of the critters had moved on as they continued their conflict. I knew black bears were native to this area, so I wanted to make sure there was a good bit of distance between me and it, just in case it decided to charge. I followed the noise of the crunching up the hill and into a nearby clearing. Moving slowly is not to startle the bear. Hell, it might not even be a bear, I thought, but deer or something else. It was neither. It was just another hiker like myself. Well, I guessed she was a hiker, but she didn't dress like one. It was a young black girl, probably late twenties, a few years older than myself, I thought. She had on a tank top with some bike shorts and sneakers. It was kind of odd, as it was unseasonably cool. It was probably around fifty degrees or so, maybe a little warmer in the sunlight. She was carrying only one of those small backpack purses. She was very carefree as she walked, humming a tune and swinging the pack about as she played with the fauna. She walked to a grouping of stones and found a small tree stump and sat down. She gazed up at the sky and smiled. Damn, she was cute, I thought, as she looked about. Her hair was short and styled, high cheeks, nice patty lips. With a fit, athletic body, maybe only a few inches shorter than me. She pulled the pack to the front and looked inside. I guess to make sure she had what she needed out here, like keys or mace or something. I thought it would be courteous to at least let her know I was out here so as not to startle her. But just as I decided to not come across as a creeper looking at a chick in the woods, I felt the air temperature just drop. I shook for a quick moment as a chill went down my spine. Who? Shit! I said aloud, but not loud enough for her to hear me as I shivered. Must have been a breeze or something, I said to myself, rubbing my arms. As I gathered myself, I noticed the sky was almost imperceptibly darker. I mean, the sun was still out, and the sky is mostly clear, but it was almost like looking at the world through barely tinted sunglasses, which I was not wearing. I started making my way to her, and then I noticed her left hand. She was holding up her index finger. It, it, it was pointed in my direction. Had she seen me? There was no way. I was in the tree land, covered in shadow, and making my way around the bushes. She probably heard me curse, and, What the F? I cried as the chill returned with no breeze at all. I looked about frightened for some reason. I didn't know why. But I was scared as hell. I looked towards the girl. I had to warn her. But warn her of what? Me being scared shitless for no reason. Then I noticed her finger still up but pointing directly at me, then wagging at me, then wagging at me, like, don't come here, stay put, stay where I was. Confused, I decided to see what. Holy, ah, I whispered to myself as I looked at her, behind her, behind her. What the hell is that? I tried to scream, but my voice died out as my eyes went wide with terror, as she just sat there not seeing the thing behind her. I tried to run, but like my voice, my legs didn't want to work. I could only watch in horror as the creature slithered much like a snake as it approached her. It rose behind her, its form like a dark, wispy, ripped, overly large and long cloak. It was a cloak of floating darkness. The bottom and arms were just like shredded bed sheets draped over a corpse, as the only true feature on it was the bony, deer-like antlers on its hooded and skeletal face. Moss, grass, and other detritus dangled loosely from its antlers. The skeletal face was human, but overly large, and its mouth a gaping pit of darkness. As was its eyeless pits, a crack ran from its temple into the darkness of the hood. It reached for the girl as a pack dangled from her shoulder. No, it reached for the backpack, the shredded, handless hem of where its arm should be gingerly reached for it. I wet myself as I knew that thing would kill her, and she'd never even know it. I guess it was a blessing to die swiftly, but if it had seen me, I'd know how I would die. Death under a cloudless, sunny day, with the sounds of the woods to muffle my death cries, as the animals went about their days like this was normal. 
to my shock, the girl pulled the backpack over her shoulder and craned her head to look behind her. You remember how you got that crease on that bony face of yours, right? She said to it with little emotion. Ah, yes, it said, raising its sleeved arm to its head. You, Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia, assaulted me without provocation, I remember. You did try to suck the life from me, if I remember correctly. She said back to the thing as if they had some rivalry or something. Did you get the items per my request? The creature said as it floated to the front to face her as it towered over the sitting woman, the bottom of its smoke. Like forms weighed silently about a foot off the ground. But had it been touching the ground, it would probably still be at least ten feet tall. It glanced down at her. May I see it? To be sure, it is what I asked for. The demonic specter hissed in its airy breath. The girl looked to the backpack and reached inside. I could feel my legs quivering as I was both fascinated and terrified at the sight before me. My brain desperately tried to understand this whole thing. A human girl is having a conversation with some ghostly monstrosity. It's sunny and cloudless, and the sounds of the forest went on as normal. I think I even heard another plane overhead as my nose took in the smell of my urine, and my weak knees marinated in the stuff, too shaken to do anything else. I watched on as the girl pulled something from the bag. It looked like a brass cup and a medallion. The creature hissed in pleasure as it rose above her, its arms fluttering like some damn bird before it settled down again. This what you mean, the girl said dangling the medallion and holding the brass cup before it. The creature shrunk towards the ground in an almost kneeling position. As it did so, the front of its ethereal body began to glow in a small circular pattern about the size of the medallion. Do you also have the other thing? It said excitedly. Its antlered head moving forward, trying to look in the pack, she pulled it back and told it to. Take it easy. She told it annoyed at the thing's eagerness. How long has it been? She asked it as she pulled forth another cup and a small bottle or something. The creature rose up and back as the light in the medallion dimmed some. It looked as if it was in contemplation. What human year is this now? It asked, 2019 of the common era, she told it, 374 of your years since I lost that. It growled, pointing to the medallion and the brass cup. Name your fee and let's be on with it, it stated, the eagerness overriding its common sense, as its formless body shuddered in anticipation. I told you my fee when you made the request. That crack on the head knocked away some of your memory, she asked it, tapping her head. Are you serious? That was your fee? Not power or influence? Or money as you humans love so much? Not adoration or some silly bargain? It said to her almost incredulously, A story! A story! She stated with a wide grin on her face. A story! I said to myself. Why something so small? Why not something of significance? The creature asked her. I too was curious about this. Because my job is to collect the history of as many things as I can. I'm also a sucker for a good story. Stories are significant. I know somewhere in that spectral skull of yours you've seen and done some shit. Just tell me one, she said holding up a finger. You are very curious for a human Abigail Mitchell of Philadelphia. It replied to her. How long have you been around? She asked the thing. Thousands of your years. Why, tell me a story of something. Eight hundred, no, one thousand years back, she stated as she placed her elbows on her knees and cupped her face like a damn kid at camp around a campfire. She even had the silliest damn grin on her face. Who was she? How could she? That was she sit around that thing like it was normal. I hadn't realized it, but I found myself sitting also on a dry patch of the ground looking on intensely. I must be suffering from brain damage or something. Fear mixed with intrigue, mixed with intrigue, mixed with heightened curiosity. I, too, waited for the story of the thing. Very well, curious one. The story I will tell you is of a really stupid boy. In his equally stupid family, the creature began.
When I was about seven or eight, I had a disturbing encounter with some kind of creature or, or entity. I lived in the Appalachian mountain range of Pennsylvania. It was November, around when daylight saving time occurred. I remember it was supposed to be a school day, but since the snow was so heavy, the buses were not able to drive out in the morning, so school was canceled for a snow day. I was so excited to spend the rest of the day outside in the snow. We had an acre of property going quite far back into the woods. I was walking deep into the forest to a small frozen pond past my property line. All of a sudden, the woods went dead silent. No birds, no wildlife scurrying around. Absolutely nothing. I remember thinking it was strange, but kept walking to make it to the pond. I should have turned around right then and there, but was just a naive little kid. After I reached the pond, everything was still completely silent, and the hairs on the back of my neck felt like they were rising. I started to get frightened, but I didn't know why. I felt like something really bad was going to happen to me if I didn't leave at that moment, so I decided to run back home. As I arrived to my backyard, I realized it was so late, and the sun was actually setting. My mom came running outside asking where I was literally all day, and to never, ever disappear like that ever again. None of this made sense to me, because I had only been outside for about twenty minutes. I left my house with my snow gear on at around ten, zero am, right after getting the snow day call. It was now almost eight, zero p.m., meaning I had been gone for around ten hours. I have no idea what happened and how I had been gone for such a long period of time. I remember only being out there for such a short period of time. I don't know if this was a skinwalker encounter or even a wendigo encounter. Has anyone else had this happen to them? Was it some kind of creature? I didn't see anything at all while out there. I didn't lose track of time, and I didn't fall and hit my head or anything. What do you think happened? Please let me know in the comments. Each year, me and one of my closest friends, who we will call Dane, go down to visit his grandparents at their cabin in a nice, small, peaceful town in the North Georgia mountains. Me, my friend, and his grandpa are all outdoors, kind of people, so we are always looking for something fun for all of us to do around the area. One night, we decided to go explore some trails not too far from the cabin. Now, these aren't the kind of trails you're probably thinking of. They really are more a gravel dirt road, but a lot of hunters, campers, motorbikers, and bikepackers use it. We headed out to the trail, and right as we pulled up to the trail, we were gonna go on. We noticed an older, beat-up, suspicious-looking black Chevy Savvy with two middle-aged men in it parked next to the entrance of the trail. Now, even though this is a safe area, drug deals and other kinds of sketchy activity can occur deep in these woods, so we avoided going on that trail and decided to head down to another trail about a half a mile down the road. We pulled about fifty or so feet into the trail just outside of view from the road, parked the truck, and got out and started our exploration. Our little night hike was off to a great start until we got about a mile in. We started to hear a dog bark from probably about 300 feet away. We decided to keep going, but the dog just would not stop barking, and we didn't know if the dog was on a leash or not and could come attack us, so we decided to turn around and head back. Looking back, I'm really happy we turned around when we did. When we were about, I would say, 1,000 or so feet away from the truck, we could see a car sitting behind my friend's grandpa's truck, running with its headlights on. This instantly made us worried, because who would just roll up behind a random truck at 10, zero at night on an isolated trail, and keep in mind, you would have had to drive into the trail to see where we parked the truck. It was not visible from the road. We stood there for about five minutes, trying to see if we could see anybody, but since it was so dark and pretty far away, it was hard to see anything. Fortunately for us, there was a pretty large tree next to the trail we were able to stand behind, so there was no way they could see us from where they were parked. My friend's grandpa took these night vision binoculars we had with us to try and get a better look, but it was still not much help. We decided to just stand there and wait for them to turn around and leave, 
because there was no chance we were going to walk back with this random car with potential bad people in it sitting behind our truck. After about ten minutes of just standing there, to my absolute horror, the car drives around the truck and starts to head down the trail in our direction. As fast as we could, we climbed up this hill right next to us and hid behind a log that was sitting up on the top. A few seconds later, the same beat-up black Chevy sub we saw outside the other trail we were originally supposed to hike on comes driving down where we were just standing, not even 15 seconds ago. The car had its windows rolled down and started to slow down as it drove past us. Me, my friend, and Grandpa were terrified. Our hearts were pounding out of our chests, and we were scared these guys would stop and sit there or even worse, get out and start looking for us. Fortunately, the car just kept driving and never stopped. As soon as the car was out of sight, we got out of our hiding spot, booked it back to the truck, and got the hell out of there. I know this may not be as scary as some others, but to us, it was definitely pretty frightening. We don't know who or what those guys wanted. My guess is they had a stash on that trail deeper in the woods and thought we stumbled upon it or something and were out there to confront us, or even worse. A lot of things could have gone wrong. We could have walked up to the truck just as they pulled in. What if they came out and looked for us? What if they slashed the tires to the truck? Or what if they turned their headlights off and sat there and waited for us to come back? My friend and his grandpa actually went back in the daytime a few days later to the exact spot where we were hiding and took some pictures posted below. The first picture is where we were standing looking at the truck and car behind it. Off in the distance you can see our truck parked. That's exactly where we had it parked that same night. Just off to the left is the hill we rushed up to hide from the car. In the second picture, you can see where our hiding spot was after my friend and his grandpa went back. They said we were very lucky to have made it up there successfully as it seemed impossible to do it as fast as we did, especially with all the shrubs and thorns in the way. If we got up there just even two seconds later, we would have been seen. I can only imagine what could have happened if we didn't make it up that hill and those guys saw us. I used to work for the Chickat County Sheriff back in the mid-90s. Chickat really is the ass end of nowhere, the poorest place in the entire state of Arkansas. Back when I was a deputy, there were never more than about 10,000 people in the entire county. It was and still is the kind of place that people drive through without a second thought. But I think about Chickat a whole lot. I, I think about it every day. Sometimes it's all I can think about, no matter how much booze I sink or how many pills I take. Back in the fall of 96, chickens started to become flooded with a kind of low-grade crystal methamphetamine that we call cranks or biker meth. High-grade meth forms crystals, hence the name, but the low-quality stuff is just a powdery white substance that can burn up the user's throat because of the crap it's cut with. We were finding that junk everywhere. It was decimating the poor folks out there. It was in the schools, in the bars, even in the churches. We arrested this one kid who, who'd been awake all weekend and had sat there twitching in the pews until a collection plate came around. Didn't even care that people saw him take the money either and was too messed up to even have any means of a getaway. Violent crime skyrocketed in the space of about four months. Things were getting out of control. We were picking up tweakers from all over that were making pilgrimages to check out just to spend their money on the cheapest, dirtiest crystal we at the department had ever seen. I put cuffs on guys from Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, even as far away as Indiana. The county sheriff even got a call from the governor who demanded something be done about it all, and as you can imagine, all that fecal matter rolled straight downhill. But we had no idea where this stuff was coming from. Anyone we picked up for selling wouldn't talk about who they got it from, no matter what we threatened them with. They were like crystal commandos. And from my experience, that's just not like tweakers to cover for each other. They'll do anything to stay out of jail because it usually means a forced detox. 
But these dealers, they kept their mouths shut like they were full-blooded mafia, La Crystal Nostra or something, like they were more scared of the guys selling it to them than they were of us. We bagged one guy with six pounds of the stuff, and it was me that drove him over to the county for booking. Afterward, I went back to my car, and there was all this mud just caked onto the floor under the back seats of my cruiser. I mean, it was everywhere. It smelled real bad, and I was pissed that he'd made such a goddamn mess. But then it hit me. All that mud had to have come from somewhere, right? And by the looks of things, we'd managed to bag the guy just as he'd gotten a re-up from his connection. So wherever this guy had just come from was muddy, real muddy, like maybe somewhere out near the Mississippi, or one of the lakes there are in Chicot. I decided to take drive just to see what I could see. Maybe a little walk, too, if the feeling took me. Besides, what was the worst that could happen? I found our crystal cooks and brought them in for the big win. Well, as it turns out, that actually was the worst thing that could happen, and afterwards I'd never be the same again. I spent a lot of time fishing with my pa when I was a kid. It's pretty much all there was to do in Chicka, a county of over 40 separate lakes and reservoirs, and I'd been to almost all of them. Most of the shorelines are shale or sandy soil, but one particular shoreline is pure mud, one you're going to lose your shoes in if you don't have the foresight to wear rubber boots, and it has the infinitely creative but descriptive name of Mud Lake. And it was Mud Lake that I decided to take drive to that afternoon. The lake itself isn't too popular with fishermen, not unless you're looking for some monster catfish and those things can be much more trouble than they're worth to reel in. So as I'm tracing the edges of it on foot, I thought it pretty strange to see a trail of smoke wafting up through some trees around the other side. I mean, it was faint, real faint, and maybe if the wind had been blowing just a little, I'd have never even seen it at all. But it was eerily still that day and just as quiet. It took me about 20 to 30 minutes of walking, but I traced the edge of the lake. Right around to the rough area, I could see the smoke. The closer I got to the source, the more I began to smell this disgusting, putrid stench, almost like a mix of rotten eggs and cat piss. I also noticed that patches of what would have otherwise been healthy plant life had started to die, like whatever I was closing in on was death itself, how no life could survive near it. I thought about turning back a few times, but eventually came across what I can only describe as a series of wood panel and corrugated iron shacks. I knew I should call out to see if anyone was home, or announce myself as a deputy and demand that whoever was inside should come out, but the feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach just seemed to stop any words from coming out of my mouth. Cops don't go by the book all the time, especially not small-town deputies like me. Besides, I couldn't hear anything coming from inside any of the shacks. And aside from the small campfire burning in a clearing between the shacks, there were little signs of human inhabitancy. I pushed open the door to one of the shacks with my forty-four drawn and immediately recoiled at the fumes that came out. I'd never actually seen a working meth lab before, but I didn't need any narcotics expert to tell me. That's exactly what I'd just seen. There was all kinds of trash strewn around in there. Discarded packaging from cold medicine, batteries that had been cut open, used coffee filters, and that wasn't including all the improved glassware set up on a small table. That, and I'd heard stories about how bad they smelled from all the chemicals being mixed up in them, which must have been where that cat piss smell was coming from. I backed off from the shack, coughing and spluttering, feeling nauseous with my eyes streaming. I felt awful, but at the same time, kind of elated. I was almost certain I'd found our meth cook. It was only when I searched the other shacks that I began to really freak out. The first one was evidently some kind of sleeping area, with two camping cots set up on either side of the shack. Only the thing was, they didn't look used at all. They were covered in the same kind of trash that was strewn about the lab. Shack gas canisters, tubs of what looked like raw chemical ingredients. Whoever used those shacks obviously didn't sleep much, if at all. There was also rolls of dollar bills all over the place. 
these guys weren't taking care of their profits at all, it seemed. Either they were making too much money to account for it all, or money just didn't matter to them, and that was a terrifying prospect to me. Whoever was flooding Chicket with Crank wasn't doing it for the cash. They were doing it for some other reason entirely. But it was the things that were written on the wood wall panels that really got my attention. All kinds of weird phrases and symbols had been scrawled on the walls and what appeared to be black marker pen, stuff in chicken scratch handwriting so bad I could barely make any of the words out that was interspersed with skulls, devil-looking things and little black stars. I backed out of this second shack and went to check on the third, which was by far the worst one of all. There was another rotten smell coming from behind a flimsy wooden door but this one was from something very different to a meth lab, and when I peeked inside, I almost puked from how bad it was. Surrounded by yet more piles of trash and money was a big old wooden stake that looked like it had been driven into the ground as deep as it had possibly go. And tied to that wooden stake was the most mutilated dead body I'd ever seen in all my years of police work. Whoever it was had been dead for a while, but they hadn't completely decomposed yet, and there were so many flying insects and maggots crawling over their face and body that at first it kind of looked like they were moving. I'm not sure how much the damage had been inflicted while they were still alive, and I pray that most of the mutilation had been done post-mortem. But the look of agony of the corpse's face makes that almost impossible to imagine. The poor soul tied to that stake that had been scalped had one of their eyes removed, had teeth pulled, fingers cut off with the stumps, looking like they'd been cauterized to stop them from bleeding too much. There were deep, dark-looking patterns of cuts around their face that suggested they'd been carved up in a kind of ritualistic way while they were still alive. The same kind of black burn marks on their finger stumps were present on the torso and thighs too, looking almost like cigarette burns, but like they'd been inflicted by something bigger. There were many other wounds on the body that would require a coroner to really be able to tell how they were inflicted, but one thing was clear to me, whoever this was had been tortured, maybe even to death. Then right as I'm about to turn around to head back to my cruiser and radio the whole thing in, I hear something moving through the trees behind me. I spin around to see the filthiest son of a bitch I'd ever seen, just walking through the trees in nothing but boots, a pair of piss-stained white briefs, a shin holster with what looked like a hunting knife tucked into it, and a gas mark. He had some kind of a variant slung over his shoulder, too, but luckily I had my... 44 trained on him before he could react and reach for it. I told him not to move or I'd put him down, and at first he starts raising his hands nice and slow. All I could see of his face was the cold, dead gaze that stared back at me through the misty, clear plastic eye, holes of his gas mask. There was just nothing behind them, like they were a doll's eyes or something, alive but not alive. Then I heard something moving behind me, and I figured it might have been his partner, or whoever the second camping cot belonged to, and for just a second I was dumb enough to give this guy my back out of fear his partner was trying to sneak up on me. But it must have been a possum or something running through the woods, because there was nothing there when I turned, and by the time I looked back, the guy in the gas mask was unshouldering his rifle and prepping to fire. I let off three shots at him, and I'm pretty sure I missed everyone. In return, he lets off an automatic burst of rifle fire that ripped up the shacks behind me, and somehow, either from the poor vision of his mask or the recoil of the rifle, he managed to miss me too. Next thing I know, I'm running through the trees, trying to use the trunks for cover in between looking for a solid position to return fire. I can hear this guy barking like a rabid dog while he chases me and I fire three more shots in a running gun battle that leaves my forty four empty. He replies with another burst of rifle fire, and although it didn't feel like I'd been hit right away, I suddenly found I wasn't able to run anymore, like I suddenly lost all feeling in my right shin. 
I hear him make this muted whooping sound, like he must have seen me go down and realize one of his shots had hit the mark, but from the lack of follow-up fire, I figured he too must be out of ammo. I didn't see any spare magazines on him. He was half naked after all, but he did have that knife on him, and I could hear him hollering about how he was going to use it on me as he took off after me through the trees. The whole time I'm reloading my 44, I'm thinking about the state of the body back there in the third shack, how no one but me knew I was out there, how he'd have all the time in the world to work me over, just as I'm assuming he'd done to that poor son of a bitch tied to the stake. That was the most afraid I'd ever been in my entire life. Every single other emotion pales in comparison to the intensity of that fear. I was shaking so bad I could barely load my revolver. Even with the speed loader, I could barely manage it. But somehow I did, rolling onto my back and aiming just in time to see that sick bastard coming through the trees at me with his knife in his hand. I put all six bullets into him, and then watched him collapse into him, and then watched him collapse into the dirt, like a sack full of rocks. It wasn't over, though. I still had to crawl back through the mud and the blood to my cruiser, and I had to snake past the cook's dead body in order to do so. The whole time I'm crawling past him. I was expecting his eyes to just open up suddenly, like a horror movie or something, for him to roll onto my back and plunge that hunting knife into my neck while I was trying to crawl away. Every second was drawn out, my heart racing as I tried to keep one eye on the guy and one eye ahead of me. But he didn't wake up, no one just gets up after taking sense of 40, four slugs to the chest. I was retired on medical grounds not long after. Doctors said the bullet that hit me fractured when it hit the shin bone, and there's been a piece of lead still stuck in my right leg ever since, meaning I now walk with a permanent limp. But that's just the physical scarring of what I went through that day. Sometimes I think the mental after effects have been far worse. I barely slept a wink for months, and if I actually did manage to drift off after drinking myself into a stupor, the nightmares would be enough to have me waking up screaming, having soaked the bed sheets with cold sweat. It got so bad that my wife couldn't sleep in the same bed as me until hours upon hours of therapy sessions gave me some small measure of closure. I thought for a while she might divorce me, because the man that came back from Mud Lake just wasn't the same as the one that drove out there. I'm doing much better now. Me and the wife are still together, and we live down in Florida quite comfortably, too, thanks to the compensation I got from the government. I got a Medal of Valor from them, too, something most guy would keep on display somewhere. But I keep that thing locked away in a drawer. My therapist recommended I write something like this to help process what happened back at Mud Lake, thinking that it might help me get past it. I told him I'd rather just forget but I know that's not possible, that the memories of Mud Lake will stay with me until I'm as dead as the cook in his gas mask. Have you ever felt a strong presence from the woods, a feeling like you're being watched? Well, the truth is something is watching you from the trees and shadows. Monsters hide in the woods, preying on the innocent and striking quickly. They won't stop. They never will. This my story, and I hope it serves as a warning to all about the truth of the woods and how dangerous it truly is. How dangerous it truly is. How dangerous they are. Growing up, I never had a dad. My father left me and my mom when I was young, and I haven't seen him since. Sure, I get the occasional birthday or Christmas card with money, but besides that, he's almost a stranger to me. After my father left, my mother decided to leave the city life behind, and we moved when I was ten to Wisconsin, where we bought a small cabin out in the woods. At first, I hated living there. The woods always terrified me as a kid. Every time I looked out the window towards the woods, I always got an unsettling feeling. Chills would run up my spine, and I would start to shake uncontrollably. I always felt something was watching me. The feeling never went away, even as I got older. I hated to walk to school I had to make every day. The looming feeling of getting watched grew even stronger as I walked in the woods. 
I felt so vulnerable looking at the tall trees. The woods I lived by had almost an endless stretch of tall trees in the forest. I felt something was watching me up on the trees. My mom, though, felt completely different about the woods. She loved them. She loved taking walks outside and just staring at the trees in the forest, taking all of nature in. She was an artist, so she loved to just sit outside and paint the trees. Many of the portraits in our cabin were of the trees in the forest. I asked her if she ever felt a presence when she was out there, like something watching her. Yes, I feel a strong presence, but it's a comforting one, she said. I feel safe and protected. I never understood why she had such a conforming feeling from the woods while I felt a terrifying one, one that kept wide awake almost every night. On one night, when I was about to go to sleep, I saw something from the trees. It was far off into the distance, but I could barely make out the silhouette of a figure. It was big and bulky with long arms, and from the angle, it looked like it was staring right at me. I froze as I started at it, then I heard my mom walking to my room, and when I turned to see her open the door, I looked back to see the figure gone. I tried telling my mom, but she never listened. She said I was simply imagining things, and that I needed to quit being scared of the woods. The woods protect us from the outside world, Michael. They are a shield to all the bad things in the world. I knew what I saw, and I knew what I saw, and I knew whatever it was wasn't protecting me. On the way to school that morning, I felt the presence stronger than ever. Every time I turned around, though, nothing was there. Suddenly, I heard a branch snap behind me, and I didn't dare turn around. I couldn't move. Then I heard another branch snap, and I took off running. I could hear fast steps behind me as I was running, which made me run faster. I could hear the footsteps gaining on me. When it seemed they were right on me, I burst out of the woods, sweating like a pig. The day went by normal. Once school was over, I asked my friend James if he wanted to walk home with me. James was my best friend and the only person who understood my fear of the woods. He lived close by to me and he also could feel a disturbing presence watching him. He tried telling his parents like I did with mine, but they didn't listen either. Dude, did that really happen? He asked as I told him about what happened on the walk to school. Yeah, man. I just don't feel comfortable walking in those woods alone, man. I know there's something in there. I said, what do you think it is? James asked as we started walking home. I don't know. I think I saw it last night, though. It was like really big with huge long arms. It was far away, so I couldn't see anything else. He was quiet now. Then he said, I think I've seen it, too. I saw something last night, too. It was a lot like the thing you describe. Then we heard a loud snap behind us and turned around to see a tree branch on the ground snapped in half. Dude, something's following us. We need to run, James said. No, don't run. I did that and it chased me. Maybe if we keep walking slowly, it won't do anything. James, looking terrified at me, James, looking terrified at me, nodded his head slowly as we started walking. We heard more snaps as we walked, getting louder and closer as we walked. I looked over at James. He looked back at me white as a ghost. After what felt like an hour, I could see the outline of my house in the distance. Our pace quickened as we got closer and closer to my house. The snaps and cracks quickening as well behind us. As soon as we got close enough, we took off in a dead sprint towards my house. Not looking back, we ran inside and I locked the door once we were inside. Everything okay? I heard my mom say behind me. We looked at each other, then I heard James say, Yeah, Mrs. S. We just raced each other to the house. She looked at me and I nodded quickly. Okay. Be careful, though, with the door. It's old and I don't want it falling off. Okay, sorry, Mom, I said as James started to run off upstairs. Once upstairs and in my room, James said, Dude, we can't walk that way to school. I know, but what will we tell our parents? They won't believe us, I said. James was silent now. I knew he wouldn't be able to come up with anything. I think as long as we're quiet and walk slow, that thing won't come after us, I said. Yeah, let's hope so, James said in a quivering voice. 
James went home shortly after that, and after I ate dinner, I headed upstairs to bed. What is that thing, I think, as I laid in bed? A person. An animal. It's fast like an animal, but it looks like a tall person. I looked out the window into the dark forest and froze. The thing was there and closer. I could make out more characteristics as I stared at it. It had a hunchback and long fingers with razor-sharp claws. I didn't see any eyes on it, but I could somehow feel its cold stare locked on me. It just stared, observing me. Then it turned around and walked back into the forest. That is no person or animal, I think to myself, once it's gone. It wants me. I'm its prey. After a restless night of sleep, I woke up and walked downstairs to see my mom sitting on the counter with a worried look on her face. Hey, Mom. Everything okay? I asked. Morning, honey. I have some bad news. She said, look at me. What is it? I asked. Your friend James. Well, he's missing. His parents went into his room this morning and he was gone. I stood there petrified. It wasn't following us. It was tracking us, tracking James. Are you okay, Michael? She asked. I could only see James' face in my mind now. The image of him looking at me as we were walking home, white as a ghost. I couldn't keep everything in, and I told my mom everything. The thing that chased me, me and James being stalked by it, and seeing it for the past two nights getting closer to me. You've got to believe me, Mom, I pleaded. Something is in those woods, and... It took James, and now I think it's gonna take me. She looked at me with a sad expression. She sighed, then said, I know this must be hard for you, Michael, but there's nothing in those woods James might have ran away or anything could have happened. Mom, it took him. James would never run away from his parents, I said. Look at me then. Look at the clock behind me. Uh, I think it's time you get to school now, dear. We'll talk about this later. I pleaded with my mom to drive me to school, begged her on my knees. She finally relented after a minute. Okay, just this one time. We need to leave now, though, and be quick. I have to get to the studio. I thanked her and ran to get my backpack and stuff. Nothing happened on the drive as I expected. After dropping me off at the front of the school, everyone ran up to me and asked if I heard about what happened to James. Everyone was talking about James that day. They started rumors either saying he ran away or was kidnapped. Do you know what happened to him, Sally? Asked frantically as she ran up to me at lunch. She had had a crush on James since the second grade, and even though James showed no signs since the second grade, and even though James showed no signs all. Affection towards her, she still adored him. She was a short girl with short brown hair and brown eyes. I debated about whether I should tell Sally the truth, but I knew she wouldn't believe me. No one would. I told her I didn't know and tried to continue eating my lunch, but she wouldn't give up. Come on, Michael. You're his best friend. Please, if you know anything that could have happened to him, please tell me, she said with tears in her eyes. I tried ignoring her, but she wouldn't stop. Then her friends came over and started asking. Then more and more people came asking if I knew what happened to James. The voices became too much for me, and I screamed. I don't know what happened to him. Please leave me alone. I screamed as loud as I could. Everyone stopped talking and now stared at me. My cheeks started to turn red as I got embarrassed. The bell rang, and everyone started heading off to class, leaving me still sitting at the lunch table. I packed my unfinished lunch and started to head off to my science class, which I had next. I decided then and there that I would find James. I had to know if he was alive or not. James, if you're still alive, I'll find you. After school, I called my mom and asked if she could pick me up. She said she could, and five minutes later, she pulled up in her white Cadillac. As we drove home, she asked, feeling better, honey. I lied, saying much better. I knew she would never believe me. I lied, saying much better. I knew she would never believe me. I was going to have to face that thing on my own. We got home and I headed straight upstairs where I dumped all my school supplies on my bed and started to pack gear for that night. I packed spare flashlight batteries, some water, and I put the pepper spray my mom gave to me last year in my pocket just in case. As I was eating dinner, I came up with a plan. 
I would sneak out of the house when my mom went to bed, which was usually around 10, and I would head into the woods and try to find a look for James. I knew my chances against that thing were slim to none, so I knew I would have to be quiet and careful. After dinner, I went to my room and waited. I waited for hours until I looked over at my clock, which read 10.30 p.m. I hopped out of bed and walked over to the window, opening it quietly. I made a little rope with my bed sheets as I waited as I knew I wouldn't be able to jump off the window without getting hurt. I tied the rope against my bed and started to climb out of the house slowly. Once down, I turned my flashlight on and aimed it towards the woods. It was even more terrifying now. The trees seemed endless and I couldn't even see the moon. I took a deep breath and started to walk slowly into the woods. I noticed something that started to scare me quickly once I was walking. There was absolute silence. Not a peep, no crickets, no owls, nothing. I flashed my light around quickly, calling out James' name quietly. James, James, are you out there? Nothing but silence echoes the woods. I walk towards the directions of James' house, thinking he may be around there. As I am about halfway to his house, the battery for my flashlight dies. Darkness now engulfs me as I panic. I scramble for the batteries in my backpack. Once I find them, I take the dead batteries out of my flashlight and put the new ones in. When I turned my light back on, I screamed. Standing in front of me was that thing. The fear I felt was indescribable. Even to this day, the image of it still fills my dreams with nightmares. It had no skin. It was all red muscles and tissues. It had no eyes, and its mouth was full of dozens of razor-sharp teeth as it smiled and drooled, looking down at me. It was at least nine feet tall, and it had a bad hunch to its back. Its claws were even sharper close up. Its claws were even sharper close up, as sharp as its teeth were. Its upper body was big and bulky, while its long legs were skinny as a twig. Its arms were huge, with big muscles and bulging veins. I screamed even more as it bent down and picked me up by the head. It dragged me across the woods as I kicked and screamed, Stupid, 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 stupid. What the hell were you thinking coming into the woods, I thought. It dragged me until I eventually passed out. When I woke, I found myself in a dark cave hanging upside down by at least five feet. The cave looked ancient, with three tunnels that led into darkness. I had never seen this cave in the woods, never even knew there was one in the first place. The light that was in the cave was from a single fire in the middle of the cave. I could see my backpack on the ground with my phone near it. I tried to reach and grab it, but I couldn't move. The thing had wrapped ropes around my angles to the sharp rocks above me. I was hopeless. I thought to James now as I started to look around the cave. In one of the corners of the caves, I saw a single orange t-shirt on the ground. That's James's shirt, I realized. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps walking towards me. I saw the thing walk into the cave as it stared at me. I panicked and started screaming again. Then the thing spoke in a dark and gruff voice, quiet food. Maybe I'll let you live a little longer. I shut up now, petrified as it spoke to me. I saw in its hand a leg. Oh God, please let that not be James, I thought. It spoke again now. I've been watching you for a long time. You have always looked the most appetizing of everyone. It lifted up the leg in its hand, then said, Your friend here tasted wonderful, but I think you'll taste it wonderful. But I think you'll taste even better, it said with a twisted grin on its face. I started to cry, weeping at the loss of my friend and knowing that I would follow in his footsteps. Somehow I got out a question in a shaky voice. What are you? The thing. Looked it down at me for a moment, thinking, then said, I am an ancient being. My kind is almost extinct, as there are only a few of us left. We have ruled the woods for the past centuries, preying on anything that steps foot on any of our lands. Over time, hunters have come and killed most of my kind. Now we hide in the shadows, only coming out when food is near. I think for a moment before asking another question. Do you only eat young kids? The thing now smiled, showing off its dozen of teeth, as it said. Of course, kids taste the best, very juicy and sweet. 
yet it cut me off the ropes with its claws, squeezing me with its ginormous hands as it started to open its mouth. I was barely able to ask one more question. How can you hunt without any eyes? It stared at me, closing its mouth before saying, I can track your scent. My nose serves as my eyes as I have none. I smell my food out before I come for it at night. Lucky for me I didn't have to come for you. You came to me. It opened its mouth wide as I panicked, starting to throw myself around, trying to get out of its grasp. Hold still food, it, it boomed at me. I was somehow able to move my hands into my pocket, where miraculously I felt the pepper spray that didn't fall out of my pocket. I acted quickly as I got closer to the thing's mouth and pulled out the pepper spray and sprayed it into its face. It shrieked as it dropped me, crying and holding its face. I got up quickly and ran towards the middle entrance where the creature came from. I ran as fast as I could, hearing the creature give chase behind me. I ran until I somehow found the entrance to the cave. I saw light illuminating from the entrance as I ran with all my might into the day. I kept running even after I was out of the cave. I ran and never looked back. I was able to somehow navigate my way through the forest to the cabin. I gave a sigh of relief once I saw the cabin and stopped running. I looked behind me now, expecting the thing to be right behind me, ready to strike. Nothing was there. I walked back to the cabin out of breath. When I opened the door, my mom ran towards me, embracing me as she cried. Where have you been? I called the police and they couldn't find you. I thought I lost you. I didn't say anything. I was tired and hungry, but worse of all, I was terrified knowing that more of those things were out there waiting for me. We moved shortly after that to Chicago and moved in with my aunt. I grew up normally and made new friends in Chicago. Even got a new best friend named Kyle. I never forgot about James, though. He was my first best friend, who was my first best friend, who had my back and died in the hands of a monster. The thought of that thing still haunts me now. I tried telling my mom what happened many times, but I couldn't. I knew she still wouldn't believe me. What scares me the most is knowing there are still more of those things out there hunting in the shadows. I write this story to tell everyone to warn everyone about these things. They hunt for children, feasting on them. Be careful near the woods. You never know what lurks in the shadows of the trees. Please don't ever go into the woods at night. They are watching and waiting for you. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.